Hello, in this video tutorial we're going to have a detailed look at SOLIDWORKS macros. We're going to look how to record macro, how to use the macros from the library or create one from scratch. We'll also take a look at uh, integrated development environments for editing the macro code, such as VBA editor or Visual Studio. We'll overview the different types of macros, such as VBA macro, SOLIDWORKS basic macro, VSTA, VSTA3 macros and difference between them. This video is a guide to SOLIDWORKS users rather than uh, SOLIDWORKS developers. So if you don't have any macro uh, experience or you don't have any programming experience, you may still find this video useful. So it will demonstrate how to use the macro from the internet, how to add it to your library and how to run it. Macro menu is available in the tools menu in SOLIDWORKS under the macro submenu or it is also available in the toolbar macro uh, in SOLIDWORKS toolbars. So you can run macro, stop macro, record macro, also create new macro or edit existing macro. So let's start by recording some steps in SOLIDWORKS user interface and see what is going to be recorded in the macro. So I'm going to start the new part, select the front plane and I will draw some circle. So, and I'm going to do the extruded cylinder. I'm just going to make the typical moves uh, which I'm going to use when I'm creating this type of geometry in SOLIDWORKS. So I might rotate it a bit, I might be using the uh, Instance 3D to extrude and I also might be doing some rotation. So once I finish I can just go to Tools uh, Macro Menu and stop my recording. I'll give it some name, so for example a create cylinder in this case and we'll be saving that as SOLIDWORKS VBA macro in SWP format. So let's now close this SOLIDWORKS model and let's uh, open that macro for editing and see what commands has been recorded. I can use edit macro button on the toolbar, select the macro, click open and now the macro popped up in visual uh, basic editor. And if I scroll down, you can see the SOLIDWORKS API commands which have been recorded. And as you can see, it's pretty messy. So it's obviously recorded all of my steps. If you remember, I was moving my model, I was rotating the model. So to make it easier when you record the macro, try to avoid any unnecessary movements. You can also pause the macro just in case you need to rotate your model or do some selections. Let's repeat the same steps, but now try to avoid any unnecessary model rotations in this case. So let's start with the part, select front plane, start new sketch, select sketch circle command from the toolbar, draw some circle, close sketch and create an extrusion boss base feature. Just click green tick and let's stop the macro at this stage. So I'm just going to add a toolbar so it will be easier for me to use it. I click stop and I just can just override the macro file. So let's close this model and see the code recorded in the macro. I'm just going to click edit macro again, select the file and now as you can see the code way more compact. All program types require to have an entry point. This is the first function which gets invoked when application is started. In SOLIDWORKS VBA macros this is the last function which doesn't have parameters. Usually that's called main but for the simplicity I would recommend to only keep one parameterless function in macro to avoid any potential problems. So let's run this macro now. You can click a green run button or you can just press F5 to run the macro. So you can see the macro steps have been executed and I have a cylindrical feature created uh, in a new document. You may have noticed that I have to do several extra clicks when I finish my macro recording. So I have to come back to SOLIDWORKS and click uh, edit macro button. So that could be simplified. If you can go to SOLIDWORKS settings and if you can find the automatically edit macro after recording option, I would recommend to enable that. So whenever you record any macro in SOLIDWORKS, it will automatically open the VBA editor once the recording is complete. Let's test this. I'm just going to start new part and create extruded cube. And I'm going to add few dimensions in there just to have some variety in my SOLIDWORKS API commands. I will start with a sketch and create a rectangle shape. Then I'm going to add few relationships and I'm going to close the sketch, add some dimensions and make an extrusion. So once complete I just stop the recording, give my macro a new name and that should pop up in VBA editor for editing. So I click save and you can see that automatically opens the VBA editor. So it's quite uh, handy when you're recording a lot of macros as you can save few clicks. Let's run this macro with F5 key. 
my API commands are executed. And in this case, I just received the uh, model dialog to modify the dimension value because I have a solver's option to enter value on dimension create. So you can either uncheck this option or just let your user click on that uh, pop-up dialog. As a summary, Solver's macro recording could be quite powerful, especially when you're just starting with Solver's API. But I would not recommend to use it on a daily basis. I would just use it as a reference only when you need to find the specific API for the certain command in SolidWorks. Furthermore, not all Solver's commands will be captured in the macro. In addition to VBA macros, you can also record VSTA macros in VB.NET and C Sharp languages. I will introduce you to VSTA macro later in the video. Now let's take a quick look at VBA editor. So on the left you can see the project tree. So it consists of the modules and classes and user forms which used in your macro. You can also uh, look up for some methods in the drop down menus. Toolbar can be customized and you can add more buttons in here. So the one I would recommend to have is a block comment and block uncomment. I would also go to customize and select if anything else uh, would be handy in my work. So for example, the one I would recommend to use is indent and outdent. So you can make your code look good. Usually code blocks inside function subroutines conditional statement or loops are indented. To make it easier, you can use a keyboard to indent and outdent. So clicking tab would indent the code and clicking shift tab would outdent the code. Clean up your macro as required to make it easy to follow and use. You can add additional modules to your macro such as class module or user form. There are thousands or even hundreds of thousands of macros available in the internet. And I'm just going to show you the steps how to download this macro, set it up and configure. You do not need to be a developer to use these APIs in VBA macros. I'm going to download the VBA macro from codestack.net website. It has a library of free macros and also some tutorials for Solidworks API. You can navigate to Solidworks menu, go to goodies, and I can just select the category where I want to search for a macro. So let's just pick up the first one in the model category. So this one allows you to display the cloud with the diameter of the selected edge in Solidworks part file. So I have just copied the code. I'm just going to start new macro give it some name and simply paste the code which I have just copied into this main module. So let's come back and for this particular macro I also need to create a class module which needs to be named exactly as it mentioned in the article. So I can just create a new class module and just copy paste the name and copy paste the code as well. So, and it is now ready to be run. You need to open an example file, uh, select some edges and run the macro to see the clouds popping up. When you receive the error like that, that means that some of the references are not added into your macro. So you go to Tools References menu, you need to stop the macro before. And here you can just browse the references which is missing. You can either select from the available references or click browse. So in this case we are missing the Solidworks type library for adding use. Here is the one I need. I can simply check it, click OK and this reference is now saved into the macro. So let's try to repeat the steps and see whether it's going to fix the problem. So I can select the macro, click open and you can see that I can see the cloud displayed next to my selected edges and they're showing up the diameter of those edges. Another useful thing you can do with the macros is to create the buttons for them. So let's go to customize menu and navigate to commands and find the macro command under categories and simply just drag and drop the new macro button onto the toolbar anywhere in SOLIDWORKS. You should select the uh, macro you want to run when this button clicked. Specify some parameters such as tooltip, um, prompt and uh, icon. And once you're done, the button is added to a toolbar and can be just executed by clicking. So if I select a couple of edges, click the button, you can see that a diameter is shown. So it could be quite handy uh, tip when you're going to use multiple macros in your day-to-day uh, -day work.
Now I just want to make a very quick introduction so how to create new macro from scratch and just write some code. So let's create a macro to find the area of the selected phase. So I just start a new macro and I will declare the solvers variable to be equal to uh, active session of solveworks. I also will declare the uh, variable for model which is going to be equal to active document of my solveworks session and now I can declare some variable for phase so basically I can just assign the value of that variable to be equal to the uh, currently selected object in this case I'm going to just use the first selected object so I'm just going to use the get selected object 6 API method and simply display the message box with the area of the phase by calling the corresponding uh, method from Solvers API. So let's test it. Select phase, click run, and you can see that some result is displayed in the message box. Good practice to try to find out what could be the potential errors when your user is using your macro. So like in this case, you can see that it was an, an exception whenever I start to run the macro when no phase selected. So let's uh, debug the macro line by line. So you can use F8 button press to debug line by line. And you can actually uh, drag and drop the uh, variable values directly into the watch screen. So you can see the current state uh, of their values. So like in this case, you can see this SW model has a plus sign next to it, which means that it has some value, while SW phase has nothing because it was never assigned. In order to handle this properly, we can add an if condition and check the state of our SW phase variable. So if it is not nothing, we can display the area as we used to do before. Otherwise, we're going to display the warning saying that please select the phase. Another handy way to debug your code is using the breakpoints. So this is a red dot on the left field. You can simply click on the spot you want your code to stop and run the macro from the beginning and the code will stop whenever your breakpoint hits. So like in this case you can see I can debug my condition and in this case my message is displayed to the user asking for selecting the face. Or otherwise I can select the face and run macro again to make sure that works correctly. So in this case I just hit an F8 to debug step by step. And you can see that uh, Visual Basic is a standalone application. So you can still debug your code while you can rotate your model and you can do any selections in SolidWorks. Extremely useful when you develop developing the macro as you can see the updates real time. This, however, are quite performance consuming, so auto process applications usually execute much slower. So we'll come later to another options of using macros to use an in-process communication. By default, the Solvers VBA macros are saved in SWP format. So if you try to open it in the notepad or any other text editors, you'll just see the binary data. There is one legacy format called SWB, which stands for Solvers Basic. And this is a macros which you can store their code in the plain text format. So let me just create a new a macro here called Open Component Pass, and I'll give it SWB extension. And I'm just going to uh, go and browse the source code for that macro from CodeStack website. Now I can use any text editor such as Notepad, Notepad++ or Visual Studio Code or something else uh, to paste this code and manage this code. So in this case I'm just going to set up the default program to be uh, used for that file type, let it be Notepad. And I can just simply paste the code over here and I can just save the file and come back to Solars and run it. So let me select the component which is a precondition for macro, go to macro run. Now I should select the Solar's uh, basic macro and you can see it is available in the selection filter. So open and as you would expect my uh, macro works. So it actually browses that component in the file explorer. So when to use Solver's basic macros? Um, basically there are some limitations and some advantages of that type. The limitations are you can only have single uh, module. So you cannot add forms, you cannot add class modules, you cannot add another modules. You cannot also add the references. So it's only going to use uh, default pre-built references such as Solver's constant and Solver's uh, type library. There are quite a few benefits of this macro type. My favorite one is as it's saved in the plain text format, you can employ some version control systems such as Git or SVN, and you can see the changes as your macro versions evolves. Second benefit is the stability. As it is saved in the plain text format, it would never be corrupted, but this could happen uh, in theory with uh, binary data. 
Last but not least is an ability to modify that macro ad hoc from another integration. So for example, you want to supply some parameters to your macro and you don't have an option for that in a typical VBA macro as they do not accept arguments, while your program, which is supposed to invoke that macro, could just modify the text format placing the required arguments and this would uh, emulate the passing the arguments to it. VBA macros are great and you can pretty much do anything with them uh, but they're based on quite old Visual Basic 6 language so which makes it quite complicated if you want to make something uh, more complex so I would recommend you consider VBA macros for simple scripts, simple applications if you need something more complex you need to jump to a more sophisticated programming language such as C Sharp or VB.NET those are object-oriented programming languages and they utilize a .NET framework which already has quite a big library of very useful functions and classes which you can use in your macro. Of course, you can use those languages when you're creating solvers, add-ins or standalone applications, but you can also use them in the macros as well. Uh, solvers allows two types of macros which can use C-sharp or VB.NET language. Those are VSTA and VSTA3, which was added in SOLIDWORKS 2018. Let's take a look at the first version of VSTA and let's create a new macro which is going to insert the node into the newly created document where the text of the node is loaded from the external file. Running SOLIDWORKS 2018 or 19, VSTA 3 might be a default option in your settings. So let's just enable VSTA 1 version of the macro. So we need to go to SOLIDWORKS settings and just untick the enable VSTA version 3. So that would enable the first version of VSTA. In the same way you are creating VBA macros, you can create a VSTA macros. You just need to select a different file type when creating the project. So in this case I just select C Sharp VSTA macro and just give it a name, something like load not on file new. Your project will be opened in the Visual Studio for application. So it is a bit more advanced uh, integrated development environment than Visual Basic uh, for application. You can see the errors over here, you can see your project references, you can add new ones, you can see your uh, project structure. Let's add some code now to load the text from the file and add the node into the active document. So here is a text file which does have some text in it and I'm just going to copy the path and load the text from uh, my macro. So at first I'm just going to call the insert node uh, solars API method and I'm just going to call it on the active document. I'm just using iActiveDoc2 property to access the active document and I just can call the insert node a method. So you can see it's very similarly uh, to VBA has an IntelliSense. I'm just going to declare the uh, variable called text and I'm just going to use the file read all text method from the .NET framework. So it just allows me to read the text into the variable just with one call. It will be a bit more complicated in uh, Visual Basic. So I need to create an, another variable for the node and the last step is I need to cast it the node because C Sharp is strong type language so you cannot just use objects and call the properties of that and the last one is I'm just going to set the position to be 0, 0, 0. In a very similar way you can debug VSTA macro so let's create a new part and just click F5 or we can just click a run button here and we also can use breakpoints so you see it compiles and runs the code and now it uh, hits the first uh, point I can just check what the current value of my variable, very similar to what you can do in VBA macros and it can create a new object but you see now my solvers is actually locked so this VSTA macro unlike VBA macro is running in process so you cannot immediately see uh, what is happening in solvers while you are developing and debugging your code so this is a major difference between VSTA1 and VBA Visual Studio has a lot of very useful uh, features which can streamline your development. So for example, with just a simple click, I can move that code into the separate method. So I'm just going to create a method called addNode and you can see that all the code has been moved uh, to a new method. So and now instead of calling the uh, inline code, I can just call the method API. I can also very easily attach to events. So for example, in this case, I'm just going to handle the file new notification and I'm just going to call that add node uh, method from there so I can just cast my parameter which is passed to that function which is going to be a pointer to my model document and I also need to modify my add node function to accept the pointer to the document rather than doing that for the um, 
active document because maybe I can open the assembly which has the components which uh, are not going to be an active document. So but this method will work still. So we can just hit the breakpoint here and we can just start to play with that macro. Let's run it and let's see what is going to happen. So we can see that um, our macro uh, is running so we can hit the breakpoint and let's now create a new document. So I expect that to be filled with a new node but it doesn't work so you see there is nothing is inserted so let's think what happening here. you might have noticed that the macro stopped once the breakpoint was hit and the last line of the main method was executed so by default macros are unloaded from the memory once the main method is complete so in this case we used event and event uh, will be sent to us asynchronously so we cannot just wait to that event to appear so we need to tell uh, our uh, solidworks to not unload the macro and keep it into the memory for some time. We can do it by changing the setting in our SOLIDWORKS. So we can just untick the stop VST debugger on macro exit. So in this case, uh, it can only be unloaded when user explicitly hits stop button. So let's try it again. Click play. We hit the main uh, method of the macro. We can click F5 to continue. Now you can see that uh, our play button is still grayed out so which means that macro is still running so let's create new part and you can see that uh, our event was handled and our node was created so here, here we go so let's try it one more time click new part and it's again hit and it's again added the new node Now let's remove all the breakpoints and see how this macro is going to operate in the background. So let me close that file and just create a new one. So you can see we're not going to hit the breakpoint in the Visual Studio and our node is still created. Of course we can go uh, into our uh, file system and just modify that text file. Just add some uh, new text here and save it and click new part again. And of course, as you would expect, now it node is inserted with a new text. There is a major difference uh, when running and deploying the VSTA macro and VBA macro. So in VBA macro, you have uh, all in one. So you have your source code and your executable in the one file. While in uh, VSTA macros, you have a, it separated. So you have a source code, which is usually CS or VB.NET files. And you have a binaries, which is a DLLs, which are got run by solders when they need to run the macro. So when you navigate to your uh, folder, which contains a project, you will see there is a bin folder, which stands for binary. And this is uh, where your uh, compiled DLLs are. So this is something which you need to redistribute if you want your macro to run on different machines. So you also need to include all of the uh, uh, DLLs which come with that, like such as uh, SOLIDWORKS interop libraries or any other DLLs you might have added uh, into your project. So like in this case, I can just copy paste those binaries and this is something which you can deploy to the, your customers or your colleagues. In order to run the macro, you just need to select the main DLL in the run macro dialog. So like in this case, I can select the load uh, node on file new DLL and when I click open, the macro is being executed. So you can create new file and we expect a new node to be inserted in there. So you can see it works and node is inserted. There is one rule you need to follow when you copy the VSTA source code from uh, another resource. So for example, let's come back to CodeStack website and just download the source code of some VSTA macro. So let me just scroll down and just uh, select the C Sharp VSTA macro, copy the code. And I'm just going to create a new uh, VSTA macro right now and I'm just going to paste the code as is. So let me just give it a name and select the correct filter. So this macro will export all document options into the text file. So let me just do a, a Ctrl V to insert all of the uh, source code from the buffer in here and let's try to run it. So as you can see, there is a compile error and it doesn't let my macro to run. So basically when you create an VSTA macro, it is very important to follow the naming convention. So in this case, your namespace should match exactly the name of your project. So I just renamed my namespace over here and now I can run the macro successfully. I just only want to uh, add some preconditions. So I just need to specify the output file path where the macro is going to store the document uh, uh, properties. So I'm just going to save it into the options.txt file. 
and just let's run the macro so in exactly the same way we can just uh, put a breakpoint to see that it successfully run and as a result we can browse to our uh, location and you should see the option .txt file and if you open that it just contains uh, the takeoff of all uh, document user preferences and their corresponding values Although these TA1 macros are much more advanced than VBA macros, they are still based on framework 2.0, which was released back in 2005, so it is still quite obsolete right now. So from the solver 2018, Solver supports a VST 3.0. Let's enable this type of macro and see the difference. So let's go to the Solver settings menu and just click that enable VST version 3.0. And since that moment, you can just do exactly the same steps to create edit or record macros as you can with any other macro types so let me just uh, create new macro so in this case I'm just going to use the vb.net version of VSTA macro I'm just going to give it some name let's create a simple uh, macro to count the number of components in the active assembly so I just hit save when I specified the name and in a similar way just going to pop up uh, a Visual Studio instance uh, with my macro code pre-filled for me but unlike previous version of VSTA this is going to use a standalone version of Visual Studio which must be pre-installed on the computer so you can see in this case it is actually using framework 4.6 for this macro. You can write the code in this macro in exactly the same way. So you have a main procedure which is going to be called as a, a macro entry point. You have a pre-filled SW app application which is set to the active solver session. And you can just use an IntelliSense, you can use uh, all the functionality from .NET framework. And of course you can use any features of the uh, modern C Sharp or VB.NET uh, language. So I'm just completing a simple code here to get all the components from the assembly, get their account and just show the message box which tells how many components are currently in the assembly. The debugging experience of VSTA3 macro is very similar to its previous version, but there is one difference. So VSTA3 runs as out of process uh, application. So you can see while I'm still uh, debugging the code, I can uh, rotate model in SOLIDWORKS or I can do any selections. So let's just complete this code and we can see that uh, our uh, message box is displayed with the number of components in the current assembly. VSTA3 macro produces output in the same format as VSTA1 macro. So if I open the folder where my project is, I will see the bin folder which contains the binaries of my project. So if I want to redistribute my macro, I can just use the binary output just here. Thank you for your time. Please follow the URL in the description for this video for more information about macros and solders API.